So hello everyone and welcome. It's good to see you. This is Santa Barbara Audubon's second virtual program and it is entitled Rodent Control Without Poisoning Our Children, Pets and Wildlife. We have presenters Joel and Keon Schulman and Kathy Schoonmaker and uh, it's very good uh, we're really glad that you are here for such an important topic. Um, I'm Teresa Fanuki and I serve as the programs chair for Santa Barbara Audubon Society and I'm hosting tonight's program. So you came into the meeting automatically muted and we ask you to stay muted throughout the presentation. And just like with our last virtual program, there will be an opportunity for Q&A with the presenters following their presentations. So please use the chat function to ask a question. If you're unfamiliar with that, it, it tends to be at the bottom of your screen. If you move the cursor down there, you click on chat, a window will pop up. You type in your question and hit return and it will be posted. And I'll be monitoring the chat and will convey the questions to the presenters during the Q&A portion. We have David Levishev providing tech support for this meeting as he does in our in-person programs at the Museum of Natural History. Thank you very much, David, for all that you do and for your, what you're doing tonight. Um, before I introduce tonight's presenters, let's go to our president, Dolores Pollock, for some brief chapter announcements. Thanks, Teresa. And I like looking out at all those people coming in. I see some people I haven't seen for a long time. And some people I don't know, so a warm welcome to everybody. Well, in Santa Barbara, it's been a fun fall for birding. We've had a lot of visiting warblers and other rarities, and we've all discovered two new places to go birding. One is the Riviera Business Park, and another one is the Log Me in Pipu trees out in Goleta, or any eucalyptus tree with lerps. Well, it's been fun. Coming up for Audubon, Rebecca Coulter and her team are deliberating about how to run a Christmas bird count this year. I'm sure every Audubon chapter is thinking about that. Uh, so I'd like to ask you to just stand by for more announcements. The um, decision will be made on no or by November 15th. Thanks to a grant from the Hutton Parker Foundation, Audubon will have a four-page insert in The Independent on November 12th. So make sure to pick up a copy of the Indy that week. I want to welcome our newest Santa Barbara Audubon board member, Scott Pipkin, the Director of Education and Engagement at the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden. Scott was formerly Director of Community Education with Audubon, New Mexico in Santa Fe. He is an avid naturalist and birder and he's the person who found the catbird recently at the Botanic Garden. You may know that we take our raptors from the Audubon Aviary at the Natural History Museum to schools, retirement communities, libraries, and so on. And they're always, of course, a big hit. The latest visit is to the Braille Institute. So Connie Edict is writing that up and you'll be able to read about it in our December newsletter. Our classroom visits are now virtual, and I want to salute our Eyes in the Sky director, Hannah Atkinson, and our experienced teacher, Patty Smart, for making this transition successful. You can read more about this, too, in the December issue of El Tecolote. I want to thank our generous do donors who are supporting us at this time when your donations are more welcome than ever. Audubon has many dedicated workers. I want to thank all of you. It hasn't been easy the last seven months, but the spirit is strong and the work accomplished is amazing. I also want to acknowledge our executive director, Catherine Emery, for her energy and leadership. Now we have Teresa Finucchi, our program chair, back to Teresa with support from David Levashev. They have made arrangements, which took a lot of work, to bring these programs to you all on Zoom. Teresa. Thanks, Dolores. 
So our speakers will present back to back, so I'll introduce them all now. Kian and Joel Schulman founded Poison Free Malibu in 2013 to work to stop the poisoning of wildlife. The effort started in Malibu and spread to nearby cities and counties and then statewide. They work as part of a coalition to pass state legislation restricting rat poisons, including the recently passed California bill AB 1788, which puts a temporary ban on the use of the four most widely used rodent poisons in the commercial pest control industry. Kathy Schoonmaker is an outdoor recreation planner for Santa Monica Mountains National Recreation Area. She has a degree in environmental biology and has over 10 years of experience working with our native Southern California wildlife, specifically coyotes, bobcats, and mountain lions. Kathy currently works on the Nature Neighbor Program sponsored by the National Park Service, providing outreach and education to local communities about our wildlife's success and struggles living adjacent to urban areas and how residents can coexist with these animals. Joel and Kian and Kathy, we appreciate you being here and sharing your time and expertise with us. And Kathy, I understand that you'll be presenting first. Okay, thank you, Teresa. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen now. All right, well, thank you for having us. And um, so part of the work that I do um, is the Nature Neighbor Program. I worked with um, the Park Service as a technician for um, many years, almost 10 years. And during that time, I was studying um, uh, bobcats, coyotes, and mountain lions with the biologists. And um, a lot of the research that we did never, didn't generally get out to the public as much. And they were very confused on, well, what are you doing out here? What do you mean there's a bobcat in my backyard? Um, tell me a little more about that. So it kind of prompted me to, to work on a grant for a Nature Neighbor program um, to get some of the information that our biologists are studying in our local park of the Santa Monica Mountains and um, present to our local public. And so this is um, pretty much a good part of that as well as we talk about the research that's happening within the park. So it's always these are some of the wildlife that live in your neighborhood, in your yards, um, or adjacent to you. So the National Park Service in the Santa Monica Mountains National Recreation Area, if you know where that's at, it's a little bit south of you, um, have been studying bobcats, coyotes, and mountain lions um, for many years. Since 1996, they've been studying bobcats and mountain lions we've been studying since 2002. The goal of the project um, was to see how these animals are doing in a um, fragment fragmented um, urban associated um, park, as well as looking at the movement patterns of these animals in this area, their diet and causes of mortality. So to study, you can imagine these animals, um, it does take a lot of work. We do capture them. Um, and when we do have them in hand, we put radio collars on them and we take blood to study the health um, of these animals as well. These are the radio collars. We are currently now using GPS radio collars, which is fantastic. Technology has changed so much through the years, and um, we are able to get uh, real good, accurate locations of where these animals go and how they move through the environment. This is the study area that we mostly focus in. We have the Santa Monica Mountains here, the 101 Freeway, the Oxnard Plains over here. And then it's bordered by the 405 freeway and then, of course, the ocean on um, the south side. And then we have, um, we do study animals within the Simi Hills as well as the Santa, Mon or the Santa Susana Mountains um, for some of our mountain lions as well. This is an example of what we're gathering with some home ranges for mountain lions within our study. This was the first 12 mountain lions um, in our study. Um, you'll see that they're called P1, P2, P through 12, and P basically stands for puma. So mountain lions have many different names that they can be called. Um, so we call them P for the puma. Um, and this is just 
basically lines that are showing the home range of these animals throughout the mountains. And you can see um, our first 12 animals pretty much use the whole Santa Monica Mountains, as well as we had some animals that were collared on the north side of the 101 freeway using the Simi Hills and into the Santa Susana Mountains. This is another um, home range map that shows uh, mountain lion home ranges in 2016. So this is the animals that we had on the air during the year of 2016. And you can see we sort of expanded. We had one animal, P22, which you might have heard of in Griffith Park area, has um, one of the smallest home ranges ever recorded for a mountain lion, which is about um, nine um, square miles. And then we had P41 that was in the Verdugo Hills. So you can see here in the Simi Hills, there were no mountain lions actually on the air in 2016. It doesn't mean mountain lions weren't there. It just means that maybe we weren't able to locate any animals at that time. So what are some of the threats that we were seeing, um, especially in the Santa Monica Mountains and um, nearby um, communities? encroachment where we have a lot of development that is encroaching into the mountains and the hills where these animals live, um, new development continuously um, coming in, the change of the habitat where it's um, altered. This is a, um, a hillside that has been cleared for development. And then we also have hillsides that are cleared for dumps or um, landfills. And then for habit, this unfortunately causes habitat fragmentation. And this is a great one of my favorite examples to show you have urbanization built all through here, but you have a small piece of fragmented habitat on this side and another fragmented habitat on the other side of all this development. And animals still need to get from one habitat patch to another. So then there's always that question that most people often think, well, people live here, we live here where these houses are and where the streets are, and wildlife is only supposed to live here. And I tend to get that on a regular basis, but it's not true. No one gave wildlife the memo that they're not allowed to cross the road to get to the other fragmented habitat patch that's on the other side. And often they will move through um, some of these neighborhoods to maybe get to the hills that you can see in the far distance. Here's an example that we get from some of our collared animals. Um, this is a mountain lion. This is actually P22 in the Griffith Park area. His um, area is definitely surrounded by urbanization. As I said, he has one of the smallest home ranges recorded and he does move within and around houses. And um, a lot of these houses in the Hollywood Hills are built on, built on the slopes. And in between the houses, there's um, open space that he, to him, looks very natural. And if there's deer moving through those areas, then there's likely a mountain lion potentially moving through there as well. So as I mentioned, and what we've seen in the study is some animals just explore um, neighborhoods and urban areas. This is a mountain lion that was in Newberry Park that was on someone's wall um, and what ended up underneath a, um, a mobile home park, um, someone's trailer at one point as well. And we've seen bobcats doing this and coyotes and of course we all see raccoons in the urban neighborhoods. So why are some of the reasons these animals do this? Well, they might be attracted by food, people leaving out trash, like this coyote here is eating from a to-go container. Um, young animals, especially mountain lions, um, might be looking for new available territory to move through. Um, some moms might be, this, this is a bobcat who um, has a kitten in her mouth here. They might be looking for a safe place to den. And this was a crawl space underneath someone's house. And then you also have, as I mentioned before, that fragmented habitat where the bobcat might try to live in this area, but it's not quite big enough. And so this animal would move back and forth to this fragmented habitat as well. And so it will move through the natural habitats. This is a perfect, a close-up picture of um, a young male mountain lion, P8, that um, actually ended up, was looking for um, 
an area to disperse to and get away from one of the um, older adult males. It was um, following him around through the mountains. Um, and an older adult male is extremely territorial and um, will fight a young lion um, and eventually kill him. Um, so this young lion was looking for ways to escape and would come right up to the edge of the 405, which of course is a very busy freeway, um, also coming up to the 101, um, looking for um, a safe route across into its own territory. Also examples of bobcats that um, live in natural habitat most of the time, but at nighttime they might venture into these urban landscapes. And um, we had several bobcats that overlapped on um, their home ranges and would venture out occasionally at night and hunting for, um, for animals, especially um, gophers and uh, rabbits. And this is um, two female bobcats that denned right in someone's backyard. Um, and um, they were related bobcats to each other. I believe they were um, potentially siblings or a mom and a daughter that um, helped raise bobcats, the young. And this is a picture of that particular mom bobcat with two kittens. So if you look closely underneath this kitten um, over here that's um, looking to the left, you can see the mom's eyes. So this is in the wall of someone's backyard. So as I mentioned, we found that these animals can move through the ur urban landscape. They do move through the urban landscape. Um, so you could expect that some of the things that we would see for mortality for these animals would actually be roadkill. And that is definitely what we did see um, with these animals is there was, a lot, there was significant roadkill from them um, where you have home ranges that are going over roads and um, unfortunately animals get hit by cars. Um, this is an example of mountain lions, several mountain lions being hit on mountain roads as well as freeways um, in the local area of our study area. Um, but we also found, which we didn't expect to find, was many of these animals were also um, getting uh, unintentional exposure to um, anticoagulant rat poisons. Um, so we started testing for these poisons as well. And unfortunately, anticoagulants prevent your body from clotting. And this is why you see animals that would actually bleed, to, bleed out to death. We found anticoagulants in bobcats, mountain lions, coyotes, gray foxes, and raccoons in our study. We also found um, many bobcats were um, coming down with mange. Mange is a mite that gets into the skin, eats this, um, basically eats the skin and the hair of um, these animals, and they itch um, constantly and basically rub their eyes and their face raw, and their eyes start to crust over, and most of the animals, bobcat-wise, um, die from starvation because they can't hunt anymore. Um, but what we did find is many of these animals that had maned also had several um, compounds of anticoagulant rodenticides in their system. And um, we found that the anticoagulants are actually weakening their immune system and preventing them from being able to fight the mange disease off, which is a disease that is within the ecosystem of these animals. And if they were healthy, they would potentially be able to survive. Um, and we learned all this through doing what we call necropsies. Every animal that dies, we actually um, do measurements. We, we do necropsies on them. We um, see what the cause of death was, and we'll take samples um, specifically of their liver to test for these um, rodenticide poisons. And as we found is rat poisons actually affect more than just rats. Um, you can see the black boxes that we put or that people put out um, in their community, even though it's, you know, kind of in their neighborhood, it's still outside and away from the house and in this natural area that we know that the bobcats move through. Um, and so here's a black box here. Um, here's a bobcat that's eating a gopher. So we're poisoning their food. Um, and then this particular bobcat in the Simi Hills had six different compounds of rat poisons in its system and also had mange. 
Um, so how does this happen? The secondary poisoning um, happens because you see these boxes, but these boxes are just vessels that we actually put the poisons, that people put the poisons in. The animals do not actually die in the boxes. And in fact, the rodents take five to 10 days before they do die. And we see these boxes everywhere. They come in black containers, green containers, upside down teas. This particular upside down tea, you can see it close up here, shows the granules are actually spilling out and these are the poisons. And now potentially birds could be coming up and picking up these grains and eating them as well. Someone's pet could come because they are a flavored and a smell and they smell good um, for these for pets. And so then you get accidental poisoning this way as well. Um, so we also studied the, um, the food source of these animals and for bobcats, they primarily love rabbits, but you can see that there is a, um, a large amount of pocket gophers that they eat as well as wood rats. And we do see them eat squirrels on a regular basis as well and voles. So, um, then you can imagine if people are targeting these particular animals. And we see this happening with squirrels and gophers and of course rats. Many people target those animals with rodenticide poisons. And then you can imagine how it moves right up the food chain, poisoning the bobcat that eats the poisoned rat and, um, and so on. And we've seen this in mountain lions. This can happen in owls and unfortunately our pets. Um, Several different types, first generation and second generation poisoning, multiple compounds in many of our bobcats that have died, two to five different or six different compounds being found in these animals. Um, found that 83% of the bobcat or the coyotes in our study tested positive for rat poisons. 90% of the bobcats in our study tested positive for rat poisons and 95% of the mountain lions in our study, including a three month old kitten also tested positive for rat poisons um, and several um, mountain lions died directly from it. So this is, I just wanted to show this, how raccoons easily can get poisoned by rodents as well. We found, or from rodenticides, we found that this raccoon, if you look at this bottom picture here, um, is underneath someone's deck. And this is where the raccoon actually died unfortunately, and of course, right next to a bait box. And it had, um, it had the bright color of poison bait in its body when we did a necropsy on it. Um, so I'll just talk about my first generation and second generation poisons really quick. First generation is generally a multi-feed poison. The animal has to go back several times to, um, to feel the effects and die from the bait. Um, and these, these poisons are primarily used on squirrels, gophers, moles, um, and voles, whereas second generation poisons is a, sec, is a single feed poison. Um, it really takes only one feeding to kill these animals, the rodents, but they don't die right away. And in fact, they take five to 10 days to die. Um, and as I mentioned, they don't actually die in the box either. And these particular um, poisons are used primarily on rats and mice. Um, recently in Agora Hills, we had our second bobcat that died directly from anticoagulant rodenticide poisoning. And this particular bobcat had first and second generation poisons in its system when it died. And you can see this bobcat used that um, suburban or semi-urban area quite a bit right here. Um, and this particular area right here that was her home range for a long period of time um, ended up actually burning. And we think that she didn't have as much cover and vegetation. So she ended up coming into that urban landscape. Um, I'm just gonna show you quickly a couple pictures of mountain lions, unfortunately, that have died. Um, our we had two mountain lions die early on in our study um, from rodenticide poisons. Um, this was P3 and P4. Um, and then we've had um, several other, this is our third mountain lion, um, perfectly healthy, as I mentioned, 
the spine in the very beginning of the program was in Newberry Park. Um, she, was ra she was captured, radio collared, and put back in the mountains um, after this incident, and she ended up dying nine months later um, from five different compounds of rodenticide poisons. Um, this particular mountain, died from, mountain lion died from six different poisons in its system. This one also had several different poisons, and our sixth mountain lion, um, P76, just recently also died from rodenticide poisons directly. This is not happening just here in the Santa Monica Mountains. It's happening throughout the state, the, the country, and in several other countries. Um, 111 mountain lions were tested in 37 counties. 95% of them tested positive. And I just want to point out um, that there are other poisons, and now these other poisons, unfortunately, are also showing up in um, some of these animals. And our, one of our most recent mountain lions that died, um, P67, although this particular lion didn't die directly from anticoagulant rodenticide poisons or poisonings in general, it did have five different compounds of rat poisons in her system, as well as a newer poison called bromethylene. And that is not an anticoagulant, um, but it's still a poison that moved up the food chain. Um, this particular poison has also been seen in other um, non-target animals, seven raccoons, one skunk, two gray fox, and a coyote that the state has detected. So there are several alternatives. There's trapping that you can do for um, controlling rodents, and then general maintenance around the house, closing up and sealing up is always an option um, that we would suggest. And in fact, it's a longer lasting kind of um, alternative. Structure exclusion, um, so sealing up all these small holes in, that are in pipes and wires and um, attics and crawl spaces so they can't get in. Remember, a mouse can get into the size of a dime hole, so you want to use very small wiring to close up. Um, just some nice, neat examples of closing up and sealing up, um, different types of tools. This one I want to point out a little bit, uh, making sure that your garage doors are sealed as well. So coming up with um, some good weather sealant for garage doors and other doors but also um, removing that access to food. I know we love our birds and our bird feeders, but birds are really messy and they drop a lot of seed. Um, so we have to figure out a way to, to, to combat that and, um, and clean up the area that if you're going to have a bird feeder, make sure you clean up underneath those bird feeders every day or you're just inviting rats to come in, as well as um, preventing access to fruit trees. And that was one, that's one of the big things I would suggest also is all these palm fruit trees and apples and oranges are all great things for rodents to eat. And some cities and people become very creative where they use bands to prevent the rats from actually climbing the trees. Removing the access through um, composting bins as well. If you have a composting bin, that's obviously um, another great area for them to get into. So you want to seal up and close up any composting bins that you have to prevent rats from accessing on a daily basis. Um, and then thick vegetation. If you have thick vegetation, this is a great place for them to hunker down and um, actually make their nests. So if you have thick vegetation that's close to um, food resources, then you're basically just giving them a place to harbor. Um, I just want to quickly talk about Ventura County Watershed Protection District did a raptor study um, 2016. Um, and in their study, so this is just another alternative, especially for park areas. Um, or schools potentially, um, is they did a study on a control site that used um, bait boxes for controlling um, rodents, um, specifically squirrels, and they did a test site um, that installed raptor perches at their this particular location, and they saw a 66% reduction in squirrel holes um, in that study um, where they had raptor perches and nest boxes installed. 
So we decided, well, let's try doing some of this at our parks and um, see what we can do. So we've started a test um, study on raptor perches as well at one of our sites in, in the National Park Service. It's a facility site where we keep um, kind of our trail maintenance work um, or our trucks and stuff. And um, we have three poles up and we are seeing raptors using it, which is great. Um, right here we have a red shoulder hawk and I've seen red tails and this is one of my favorites is the great horned owl as well is using it at nighttime. So we have diurnal hunters and nocturnal hunters, which is wonderful um, at our site. I also have been talking to some other um, homeowners that live locally um, and partners and we had um, uh, HOA and Thousand Oaks put up two barn owl nest boxes in 2019. One box um, this year actually was used for nesting, which was pretty awesome. Um, and the remains, we examined the remains in the box. So we clean when the box got cleaned out, we actually looked at it to see what kind of um, prey they were eating. And we found the remains of 24 rats. So that's good. They were eating rats, which is what the homeowners um, or that area really wanted them to eat. So um, that was pretty beneficial. We also um, been working with Oak Park School District. They put up um, 10 barn owl boxes. The principal of the high school used a, um, made it an Eagle Scout project for his son. And they put up 10 barn owl nest boxes in 2019. And in 2020, we found that three of the boxes were actually used. So this year, three of the boxes were used for nesting of barn owls. Um, and the schools, you know, you can be a little more worried. Are they actually going to nest near a school, um, mostly because of the disturbance? And this year, you know, maybe they nested because, you know, we are in the COVID and not too many kids were actually at school right now. The schools were shut down. But what I thought was really interesting is these container classrooms were put in this year um, while the kids were out of school during the COVID. So, and then you can see the nest boxes right here. And this is the next box that actually had, um, um, was used for nesting and had chicks in it. So I thought that was pretty promising. So they can ha definitely handle some disturbance as long as there's that hunting area nearby. This is another location that had a, a barn owl as well. And that's it for me. So if you have questions about Nature Neighbor, you can always go to um, go nps.gov, Nature Neighbor, and um, also there's an email for that as well. So I'm going to stop sharing and I'm let Joel go ahead and take this over from Poison Free Malibu. Okay, yes. Uh, thank you, Kathy. Your talk is getting better and better. We do these talks with Kathy all the time, and uh, I keep, keep learning. Um, so we're going to talk about rodent control without poisoning our children, pets, and wildlife. I'll talk the first part. Um, Joel and Keon will talk the second. Um, and uh, Okay. We started in 2013, and uh, our goal was to protect children, pets, and wildlife from toxic pesticides. 2013 was when it was becoming more and more known that these poisons were affecting the wildlife. It was in the news and uh, the reports from the National Park Service were coming out. So we go to the public, we go to fairs and talks like this, uh, we go to businesses and uh, government um, at various levels. And we learn what's actually going on. We go to shopping centers, restaurants, schools, parks, and homes and homeowner associations to see how the rodenticides are actually used to see if there are alternatives and, and uh, what kind of use is going on. And we, then we go to the various levels of government, city, county, and state uh, to protect, uh, to encourage action to protect the wildlife. Kathy already gave these statistics. I'm just going to update one of them. Go to the bottom here, uh, the mountain lions. Um, there's a little bit more numbers, uh, 2016 to 2018. 252 mountain lions were tested all over California, and 96% were exposed to poisons 
and Kathy gave the numbers for other. The other thing uh, Kathy didn't emphasize as much because it's not as been studied in the Santa Monica's is owls and hawks are also absolutely some of the biggest victims all over, all over everywhere. And again, it's 90%. Um, if just one or two people in your neighborhood uh, start using the poisons, your owls will disappear. We've experienced that and heard sad stories from around Malibu of people finding barn owls in their driveway, for example, recently. Uh, Kathy talked about the mountain lion deaths in the Santa Monica's and she showed these pictures and the first and second generation anticoagulants and the number of anticoagulants. And she talked about the, the bobcats and the coyotes. And uh, this was a friend of ours in Chatsworth who was watching this owl family for years um, up, in a, up in a palm tree. And a few years ago, the babies were lying on the ground bleeding. And it was because a pest control company had actually been going around her neighborhood and drumming up business. And this was the result. The owls disappeared after this. Um, let me emphasize something we try to spread around here. If you find a dead owl or even a bobcat or some animal that you wonder, um, this doesn't look like it was hit by a car or this doesn't look like someone shot it. Maybe it's poisoned. You please consider contacting the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. The reason is they collect these incidents and these incidents are exactly what we need to make the case that the poisons are doing the damage that they're, they're doing. Uh, in this case, it's you may not, if you wanna record this screen, please take a photo. But this is who you contact and you put the, 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 the body in, a fr in, in plastic bags in a freezer as soon as possible. And they will actually mail you a styrofoam container uh, that you can mail back to them. Okay, Kathy showed boxes and this chart. And now um, here's something that I wanted to concentrate on. People are asking, I saw in the chat, about what are the rules right now? Well, let me say it is a little bit complicated, but here's, I'm gonna make a review. The number one status that is very frustrating is something called preemption. Preemption is a state law that forbids localities from having any control over pesticides at all. And it happened in the late 80s and early 90s. Mendocino County wanted to protect their children who were being sprayed by herbicides. So they passed a law to ban it. The pest control lobbyists fought Mendocino County all the way through the court system to the California Supreme Court and lost, Mendocino County won. So the pest control lobbyists went to the California legislature and bought a special law from them, for themselves called preemption to counter the Supreme Court decision and to take away the ability of local jurisdictions to control pesticides. That's very frustrating because there's many cities that we work with who would love to ban pesticides on their, throughout the city. However, any city or county can certainly ban pesticides on the property that they own. No one's forced to use pesticide on their own property. So that, but they can't tell uh, the public what to do. We are fighting that. We've gone to the League of California Cities uh, with the city of Malibu and in 2018, they actually passed a resolution agreeing that preemption was really bad and everyone was for it, including the agriculture and conservative cities, because no one likes the state to tell them what to do. And what we need is a legislator to introduce a bill to negate preemption, and then the league will help lo lobby uh, to pass this bill. This is kind of our plan for the future. So that's about preemption. What's the status now? Well, in 2014, the California Department of Pesticide Regulation which is closely linked to the pesticide in industry, but they could not deny the harm being done. In 2014, they banned the consumer use of second generation anticoagulants. And Kathy said what those were. We said at the time with many other organizations, this was not gonna work because this, the anticoagulants don't come predominantly from consumers. They come from the pest control service companies in their trucks that deliver all those black, the, the plastic boxes that Kathy described, hundreds of them in homeowners associations and at shopping centers and businesses and even schools. And it did not work. 
Four years later, the statistics were the same. There was no improvement, but the Department of Pesticide Regulation would not act, so they had to be sued. And we helped with that lawsuit led by the Raptors or the Solution Group up north to force them to reconsider the second generation anticoagulants, which is going on right now, but could take several, typically several years. So our coalition got together um, with our local legislators, uh, Henry Stern and Richard Bloom and um, Laura Friedman and, and, Glenn, and Glendale. And we passed on our fourth try, we passed <laughs> legislation, AB 1788, which bans second generation anticoagulants while this reevaluation is going on. Another thing that we strongly suggest, and it's something we did in Malibu, if you ban the rat poisons, then you actually have to do the correct thing. And the correct thing is stop breeding rodents. How do we breed rodents? Through garbage. And this is basically true for commercial areas where if you go in the back of shopping centers, restaurants, movie theaters, you will see dumpsters, these big dumpsters, which are out of, which are completely not maintained with garbage all over and the lids open. That has to be stopped. And Justin Malibu recognized this and passed an ordinance saying with, with significant fines, you've got to enforce it too. Dumpsters must be really sealed and closed and locked so that you stop breeding rodents, which is the true cause of the problem. Uh, here's a nice, uh, 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 screenshot of Governor Newsom signing AB 1788. He gave us an entire half hour. This is like fires were burning and uh, he was extremely busy, but he gave us a, uh, the, the coalition a 30 minute Zoom meeting while he signed it. And it was a really nice party with all our coalition friends. And that's how much he cares about this particular issue. Um, like I said, um, Cities can ban rodent poisons on their own property. And a bunch of cities have done that in Southern California, 12, and in Northern California. So we would like to help you. I don't know, Goleta, I'm not sure about the status of Santa Barbara City, Santa Barbara County, nearby Carpinteria. If you live in one of those places and you'd like us to help, we would love to help you pass a resolution of this kind. Really special thing about Santa Barbara and uh, Goleta and neighboring cities on the coast. You are in the California coastal zone. That is a special state designated area where you actually can regulate pesticides because of state law. Remember localities cannot, but the state can. We went through this five year period in Malibu to get this done and we have achieved that in Malibu and also north of Malibu in the LA County unincorporated area. Please contact us if you would like to use the Coastal Act to ban rodenticides in your area. And Kathy already talked about this too. It's not just second generation anticoagulants. She showed the same picture, it's first generation. This bromethylin is really new. Okay, anticoagulants are being faded out. They're being taken over by really nasty stuff like bromethylin. Other ones, um, I wanna talk about colocalciferol. It has this wonderful name, vitamin D3 and it, it, people are going towards it, and it's ridiculous. Yes, it's organic, but so is strychnine. Strychnine comes from trees, vitamin D3 comes from sheep, believe it or not, and it's really nasty and unpleasant. Uh, don't be fooled by these non-anticoagulants. There is no excuse for a bait box. Just close. Laurel Cerise is the world's experts and did the studies on the poisoning of bobcats. The red, I wanna read the red line. The truth is no poison is a good poison, no poison available, it poses no risk to wildlife. We suggest solve the problem, do not use rat poison. Thank you. I will be speaking next. Uh, I'll bring up the issue of our children. Our children are also being accidentally poisoned. Uh, we have a, um, a, an example here of uh, deceptive uh, uh, advertising by Tomcat. Uh, this is a no antidote. Again, we've got problems with these uh, new poisons that are coming up. Look at this kid-friendly uh, little uh, little sticker on there. And oh, kid and dog-friendly resistant uh, boxes, child and dog resistant boxes. This there's not one thing on this package that said there is no antidote. And this is an extremely dangerous poison. And this is what we have to be dealing with. This, these are over, uh, available over the counter. And this is very, very bad news of what's happening now. 
Uh, also the pets, we've got at least 6,000 pets per year that are also consuming these poisons. They do mix the poisons with these flavoroids, at least 30 different types of cheddar cheese, peanut butter, that attracts your, your pets also to eat these poisons. Uh, after researching all so much of uh, various uh, uh, techniques and what needs to be done, we looked for solutions. And the solution that we found is see red instead. Repel, exclude, and deter is the answer. Uh, I'd like to review the benefits of the mice. I know people don't, they're not too on the big list, but they are very important because they do uh, uh, sustain all of these animals that were all on the, on the connect, uh, that are being fed through these poison bait boxes. So the snakes, the fishers, the coyotes, the owls, the skunks, bobcats, mountain lions, they all eat these uh, mice and rats. They're very important to our, to our system. So let's go through quickly. I, uh, all of the suggestions that I have here on my website, uh, I have various links. So these are just uh, outlines that you have here, but you can plant various repellent plants. Uh, the mint varieties, they can't stand the smell of mints, which is a very interesting uh, thought there. Anything that smells good to us, which I enjoy, the mint, lavender, rosemary, sage, marigolds, they can't stand it. So we can do, if you have a garden, you can start uh, planting some of these uh, plants around. If you don't have a garden, you could use the essential oils. Uh, they are becoming more and more popular on your products list you, uh, with peppermint, spearmint, garlic oils. Uh, this is what we uh, use. We do use the uh, peppermint oil on our uh, car, which I'll get into later. Uh, also, there's motion detector water sprays that work well. Strobe lights are work excellently. I've heard many good uh, talks about strobe lights being placed around your house and also inside your car, which I'll talk about later also. Uh, there's professional level repellents that are very popular now. Uh, Western Exterminator is actually using a, a, a repellent called Detour in their boxes. Uh, there's been a big surge in the use of Propel, which is peppermint. Again, that peppermint, it, rosemary citronella, is sprayed on the buildings, uh, and it's been very popular uh, as a repellent. Uh, excluding mice, again, uh, sealing all buildings. Don't ever fill your trash dumpsters, again, the barbecue, garage doors. You can do underground barriers. This pea gravel trench uh, works really well. Uh, details of all this is on my website. Here's an example of what has been happening in Malibu and in the 11 cities that I've been working in uh, worth, with. Uh, this is what you will see when you go in back of your, your shopping mall. I went around to see why, why are people using these boxes and where are they using them? And right next to these uh, open dumpsters with trash all over, you will find bait boxes put all over. The pest control companies have no interest in, uh, in solving the problem. Their job, as it was explained to me, is to kill animals, and they're not to, they have no interest in looking around what's causing it. So what we've done in Malibu is we've uh, established, uh, as Joel mentioned, a lidlock ordinance where this prevents overstuffing. A lot of our businesses uh, likes to overstuff their dumpsters so they don't have to order a new one. Uh, we have unauthorized access, a big problem here in Malibu that prevents that. We also, this provides a, the uh, responsibility of the waste control companies to give us uh, uh, sealable lids because the lids were not being, they were warped. You couldn't even close them uh, when, when we had the old system. So no garbage, no rats, no poison, and save money. This is a real key is to have a, a lid lock ordinance. Uh, the buildings must be sealed. We do recommend not hiring a uh, pest control company or a pest or a poison distributing company uh, because they will also tell you they do exclusion in your home, which is absolutely essential. We recommend hiring a rodent proofing and exclusion company. Uh, pesticide companies uh, will do the exclusion, but they will try to talk you into uh, buying uh, a, a system where they uh, line your property with poison bait boxes before they leave so they can have their monthly fee. It is not necessary to kill rodents outside the building to protect your inside. Uh, to, we must deter the mice and rats through barbecue, cleaning up, pet food, 
Again, the bird seeds are so important. Uh, a quick little story here. Uh, I love my birds too. That's why I love talking to Audubon. Uh, I have a huge flock of crows here now, at least 30 of them. It's fabulous. I've never had so many. However, I in my earlier days, I, 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 I went to Home Depot and they had all these little bells of seeds and I, I covered my entire orange tree with all these little bells and it, it was just wonderful. I saw all these you know, birds flying in and eating them, but I didn't realize what was happening at night. So we do have to take in those bird feeders. What I do now is I still enjoy my birds. I put out a tray in the morning for breakfast only. They come down, have breakfast with me. I get to see and enjoy them, and I take away the tray. That's the only way it really will work. Again, the uh, pet feces, pulp, fallen fruit, debris, raptor poles and owl boxes are very important. The owls, uh, the raptor poles during the day, the raptors eat the uh, the, ro uh, the um, ground squirrels and uh, raptor um, uh, and squirrels and rats during the day and the owls at night. So it's very important to have both of them, a very uh, a wonderful system here. Encourage biodiversity is one of the major keys there. Uh, coyotes, dog, cats, bobcats, skunks, they all serve a, a, a service here. Uh, protect your vehicles. A lot of people have problems with rats in their cars. Wouldn't you love to have a car like that? Um, but here's a few hints. I have more details on my website. These are just an outline sketch. Leave the hood up. Remove all the food. I was just recently in Sequoia Kings Canyon and I thought it was very interesting uh, that the rangers there demanded that you remove your baby seats from your car at night because the bears would break in just to get the food off the baby seats. So that, I thought that was an interesting can even have uh, those seats in their car. But do remove all your food from your car. Uh, the shrubberies or vines that near, that's near their entrances to your car. Strobe lights again work very well. I've got, I've got um, um, examples on my website where you can click into that. A lot of good uh, uh, reports on the strobe lights. Repellents, we personally use uh, peppermint oil on our engine. We happen to have a Japanese car. And uh, as I'll talk later, uh, the uh, Japanese cars and, and the Honda varieties, uh, they made their wires out of soybeans. And so if you're having, if you have an oriental car, a, a Japanese car, you might consider a, a Honda motor tape came out with, they had so many lawsuits against them that they came out with a Honda motor tape where you actually wrap your wires with this KCM uh, thing. Uh, uh, hot, pepper. hot pepper, and uh, uh, other people use uh, the just smelly things in their engine, pine saw, Irish uh, soap. Uh, the car dealers, as I spoke to on in, in Thousand Oaks, they use laundry dryer sheets, the lavender dryer sheets from Trader Joe's in their car, and they say that works really well. There's a really good video here with peppermint oil that, 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 uh, that uh, we really enjoy, so maybe you'll enjoy that too at some time. We really request that you do not use glue traps. These are extremely inhumane ways of, uh, of trapping animals. All of the uh, environmental groups across the nation do not advise them because of their inhumane way that the animals die. Here you see a red-shouldered hawk caught in a glue trap outside uh, near a dumpster. Never, never use any traps outside of your home. Uh, gophers and ground squirrel burrows, many species also live in their burrows, the, such as burrowing owls, the gopher snakes, spiders, raccoons, foxes. These all use the, the burrows of these animals, so please never use gases in their burrows like fumatoxin, carbon monoxide, or carbon dioxide. I'll try to speak very quickly now about the uh, a few uh, outline about the gophers and ground squirrels. First, break up their holes with a, with a, a rod. You can insert a repellents then. Uh, for predator urine, uh, we use uh, our organic kitty litter. Uh, uh, don't use the other type. That's, uh, that's mined from uh, sheet mining, and they add chemicals to that, uh, to that other kind of kitty litter, organic kitty litter. We use a walnut kitty litter, and we add that to our burls. Uh, and uh, good reports on uh, critter litter. Uh, Excellent reports on castor bean granules for larger areas, uh, such as um, uh, 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 you know, uh, 
school yards yes, and such right. landscaping. Uh, motion detector water sprays also work very good. And plants uh, such as with roots that have poisonous roots so that you could change your landscaping to prevent them and make barriers. One, uh, one flower that I, uh, grass that I'd like to mention here is the sour clover grass, which is a very interesting plant. It has nitrogen. It has a nitrogen fixer on the top. It's good for the, uh, for, uh, for that rehabilitation of the earth. And it has eight foot long roots that is poisonous. They used to use this in, for rodent control before the advent of pesticides in, uh, in all the orchards. Excluding them, you could use mesh, mesh fencing, you could do trench barriers, uh, you could also line your entire garden with this hardware cloth uh, and construct little barriers around your garden and uh, they do have true-proof true netting. And uh, again, easily de deterred the gophers with raking up uh, berries, the pet food, trash. The owl boxes, again, are essential and encouraging biodiversity. Again, here's that same study that Kathy was talking about. Absolutely a phenomenal study. They removed all of the poison bait boxes, and they had put up the raptor poles to remove the ground squirrels. It's working fantastically, especially uh, we have a lot of um, uh, references in uh, in vineyards. They, uh, they use these uh, exceptionally in vineyards. Here's a couple of pictures of um, hawk that I actually took at Malibu High School. This is a little ground uh, uh, red-tailed hawk on top of a gopher's, uh, gopher hole. And there he is on top of a, 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 a post, you know, a, a ground post there, uh, but um, a goal post where uh, we could uh, offer some uh, rodent, um, we can offer some poles there for them. So uh, raptor poles will be an, a great idea around schools and such. So he, it does work. Here's some examples of local areas that are pesticide free. We got Oak Park School District, uh, Pepperdine, Pierce, Ojai, Goleta. Uh, we've got a, a couple. We've got park districts. Malibu itself went pesticide free on all city property since 2016. Irvine has a um, organic pesticide free policy. There's many, many more. You could see them on our website. Also, and here's a couple examples of uh, rodent free HOAs that got rid of their poisons and are saving huge amount of money. Here's some of them using Propel, as I mentioned before, instead of the bait boxes. Uh, but the bottom line is this, remove the poison, solve the problem, and save money. Repel, exclude, and deterring is the common sense solution, not poisoning the environment, because when we poison the wildlife and earth, we are poisoning ourselves. Pesticides are in the air that we breathe, the water we drink, and the food that we eat, where it is also absorbed through our skin. Please help stop the poison bait box chain. There is no excuse for poison bait boxes. Thank you very much. And please uh, write, if you have any questions or would like our help, please note our email address and also our website, which has more of the information Kian was talking about, poisonfreemalibu.org. Can share pictures. Pictures of us. Stop share, and there we go. There we go. We're Thank back. you very much. Um, Joel and Kian and Kathy. It's a sobering topic for sure. <laughs> um, there, uh, please, there definitely, um, if anybody does have a, a question, please, that was a lot of material, please um, put it in the chat. Um, somebody, I think that you might have answered this, but there was a little discussion about whether the second generation anticoagulants actually are only available to the industry, not to over the counter. Um, but I mean, I know now they've been banned temp at least temporarily. So could you just clarify that to answer the, the chat that has been going on? Is that clear? Yeah, um, I, did, I did mention it. Um, in 2014, the Department of Pesticide Regulation as a state agency banned the second generation anticoagulants from consumers. They could not go to the, you could not go to the hardware store and buy uh, these particular products, which have these four particular really bad ingredients. 
And like I said, we actually, we and others talked, had a meeting with the Department of Pesticide Regulation, a telecon, and we said, this is not going to work because most of this stuff comes from the, not from consumers, but from the pest control service companies in their trucks, spreading the bait boxes all over. But we had to wait four years and then it did fail. The statistics were, were just as bad. So we did succeed just one month ago in banning their use by the pest control service companies also, at least until the moratorium, uh, at least until the new, new regulations are created. But there's so many poisons out there. We still have the first generation that's available. We have now what's coming onto the scene is, is the is the really bad ones with with no uh, with no antidote. The uh, the bromethalin, uh, the uh, cholecalciferol, vitamin D three. We got the strychnine coming back. You know, so that's why we say we just have to break this bait box habit. Okay, there is no magic solution. There's no magic potion that we could put inside of a bait box. That that's going to make the rodents go away. We are the cause of the. Uh, uh, we are the cause of the reason why we have an excess of, of rodents in our area, and and we have to just control our habits. You know, it's 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 something like you know a, a person who's overweight and they just want to have a magic pill to help them uh, reduce weight. It's not going to happen. You're going to have to exercise and watch your diet. You know, uh, or you know they're looking to. So this is the same thing that's happening with the with the the poisons out there. There's no excuse for poisons. We have to get rid of this idea that a some there's some magic solution that we're going to put in a bait box and it's going to take the road all away. I've seen the excess of dumpster uh, trash everywhere and, and we reviewed what needs to be done in its simple common sense uh, solution that costs no money, just attention. Okay. Um, a couple more detailed questions about the poisons. Um, I think we know the answer to this one, but Melissa asked local pest control companies are using uh, bromethylene and are claiming it to be safe for secondary predators. Can you comment on this? Kathy, were you? Um, I mean, it's basically the state is still seen, and if you saw the slide, um, there were several different um, non-target species animals that were um, found that actually had bromethylene in it, as well as most recently the mountain lion that died on P67. She also had it in her system. The problem for us is testing of all these different types of chemicals is extremely expensive. Anticoagulants, we can test the livers and we can find the different types of anticoagulants. Bromethylene testing is a different type of test. So it costs more money and knowing to test that animal or not to test that animal is really difficult. So um, especially these studies, uh, these studies are basically we're holding on, you know, to getting collars and doing whatever we can just to study the animal, let alone the cost to test them when they actually die. So it's, we get a big backlog on testing. I, I would like to, I would like to bring up the point of how, how often and frequently and almost 100%ly the pesticide companies lie to you. They lie to you that their poisons do not affect the wildlife. Uh, uh, over and over, this has been repeated to me from, to from multiple, multiple uh, uh, companies, major companies. I would call personally and I'd say, oh, you know, do, do you offer the poisons? And I hear that the poisons, you know, travel up the food chain, you know, and poison the animals. And they would point blank say to me, oh no, the poisons don't go up a food chain. It's sort of like a, a little stomach ache they have and they eat the poison and they go back into their burrows in the ground and they die in there. So there's no, there's no danger to children, pets or wildlife. You, you, you saw the, you, you saw the, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the bad advertising they were giving on brom bromethylene, which is one of the highest dangerous poisons with no antidote. And they're, they're having a happy little child there with the pet next to it. I mean, this is the, this is the, the exaggeration uh, of their lies that they will constantly tell you that they, it does not affect the wildlife and it, and, and it never stops. They, they constantly tell you these, these lies and fabrications. Actually, this, this mountain lion with bromethylene is really significant to me 
because mm -hmm. the previous poisons, um, you know, uh, dogs get poisoned, raccoons have been poisoned by bromethalin, and other animals who you can sort of envision as having snuck into the bait box or the bait mm -hmm. box broke open or something. So it, it is possible they could have been directly poisoned by eating the poison directly. But a mountain lion, no way. There's no way a, a mountain lion could directly eat bromethalin. This is secondary poisoning, which uh, has been under dispute. But this is really clear evidence that there is some amount of secondary poisoning going on. And the reason it hasn't been as well known, it's just like Kathy said, and Laurel Cerise said exactly the same thing. It, if you don't test it, you don't see it. Yeah. So the it, testing has to occur. It's the same thing for humans. You have to be, you, you aim for what you're looking for. And if you don't look for it, you, you know, if you're not testing for it, 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 you won't see it. So they have not been testing for these alternative uh, 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 pesticides because the majority of the uh, poisons that were in the bait box, boxes up to this point has been anticoagulants. So now that that's being phased out, uh, we're seeing an upshoot on these other non, very, very dangerous ones with no, with no antidotes. Olivia Darezzo, please contact us. We would really love to help you with the dumpsters in uh, Goleta. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Um, So uh, Jan says virtually all the water reclamation plants use poison bait boxes and over-the-counter baits all over their plants. Some are independent, but most are city or county managed. Is there any move to address this specifically? I don't know about water reclamation. I, I don't actually know why they would do that. Why do they, Kathy, do you know anything about water recl reclamation plants? Um, by the county, that's probably why. But no, but why would they're, they have rodents? Why would they even have rodents? No, I think they're, uh, they're, it's a lot of it. A lot of it's ground squirrels, from my understanding. So they also have um, some um, some some pools that they need to protect the dam areas, um, and so they get a lot of disturbance from ground squirrels. So I think a lot of it is ground squirrels that they target, but I don't and maybe everyone targets around the buildings for some reason everyone um targets rats right so around <laughs> almost every office building <laughs> that someone works in you can see a bait box for rats so in general yeah that's where we found that basically owners of businesses hire property management companies which just automatically even if there's no food no rats no nothing it's absolutely automatic that they hire a pest control company to put out these poison boxes. Homeowner yeah. associations also, some, some have problems, some don't. But even the most pristine ones, they will have hundreds of poison paper. Oh yeah, please also contact us if you'd like help with your homeowners association. We talked to a lot of homeowners associations with Kathy, with board meetings, either board meetings or with memberships. We need to be invited by you know, one or more members. And we would love, we've done this, we'd love to explain to a homeowners association board why you, the damage that's being done. There's a huge, I mean, really, there's an incredible number of poison bait boxes at homeowner associations, a lot of them right next to nature. And we, you know, please invite us and we'll do a Zoom meeting at your HOA. I mean, this, this is traditional way of, of handling things with businesses. We, we've had rushes. We've banned poisons here on, in the city property, but we have other businesses that come into town here in Malibu, for example, one of ours, Urban Outfitters. They moved, in, they moved into one of our buildings, and there's no, there's no rodent problems. There's no rodent issues. No and they, and they, they surrounded the entire building with poison bait boxes, such as as routine. Okay, so this is what's going on. It's, we're, we're in an ocean of these poison bait boxes everywhere. And we just have to get, rid, get, get the idea out to break this chain of this habit of using these poison bait boxes. Uh, they're doing no good but poisoning our environment, poisoning our children, pets, and wildlife. And there's other ways to deal with it than providing these poisons. And um, they're absolutely not necessary. We have alternatives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, 
Somebody had a, a, a good thing to report. Barbara said, I had a problem with ground squirrels chewing brake lines to my truck. I had to replace the brake and electric line several times that she found that senior feed, which is a supplement for horses, worked well to attract them to a trap. <laughs> oh. <laughs> anyway, I mean, Scott Cooper, you, you definitely know what you're talking about there. Um, we have the same questions. Yeah, um, the reason the... The, these things are not totally banned is because resistance from the very powerful and financially rich uh, pest control lobby. That's why we keep on trying. Uh, yeah, let's let that say. peppermint. Uh, that's what works really well on our engine. Uh, peppermint, essential oil of peppermint. Try spraying that peppermint, on as a, as a nice repellent. Uh, you could try that. Yes, yeah, Scott was um, for those that aren't reading the chat is I was asked, talking about the. Um, California Department of Pesticide Regulation and well, look what, what are they likely to institute? I, I mean, it sounds, I'm curious about how that, how is that body created? It sounds a little bit like the fox uh, protecting exactly. the hen house. That's exactly good. Tell them well, about who, who's, the, who's in charge the, now. The, the head of the, <laughs> it's called the PCOC, the Pest Control Operators of California, the lobbying group. He went to that job as the head lobbyist uh, after being eight years uh, second in command at the Department of Pesticide Regulation. They're all very, very buddy-buddy. Uh, and uh, one thing we're worried about, for example, right now, is this ban takes effect January 1st, the AB 1788 ban. But now the pesticide companies are saying, oh, can't we please just use up the poisons we have on hand? And the truth is they can just return them because the rest of the country uses it. But they're actually, there's going to be a negotiation where they're going to be allowed to phase out these poisons. And this is something of concern right at the moment. Yeah. We're dealing with right now. But Kathy, do you want to ask, answer this? Scott Cooper was asking, what happens after a fire? The rats explode after a fire. It's absolutely yeah. true. Uh, yeah. but Kathy, do you want to say anything yeah. about it? Well, I mean, I, I, we don't know for sure because we don't actually study the rats after the fire. <laughs> I can't, you know, I can't say okay. for sure. Um, those of you who live in those areas probably know more than I do because I don't actually live along the open space. Well, well, well actually, we, we, we should answer that. Yeah, we yeah, should. Because yeah, you we guys were fire. part of the fire. We've been, yeah, <laughs> yeah, we, we've been through a couple of fires out yeah, here, and yeah. yes, indeed, uh, all of their food is is is, is gone. Habitat. Uh, their habitat is gone, and it was the saddest thing to see all of these rats with all their little fur burned and their little hands burned. It was the saddest thing. Mm. There were so many of them. All I could do with my house half burned down is just put out bowls of water and milk for them just to help them along the way. I've never seen such sadness and, and despair from, from these animals. And uh, yeah, it, it does happen after a fire. Once, once things settle down, and they uh, and they get their habitat back. Uh, things will will get better. They will. They're not there for your home. They're you know they're trying to find a home. So you have to make sure you know your home is sealed. But when your house is burned down, a good part of it, like ours was, it was kind of hard to seal them out because everything was open. But um, yeah, this is this is this is true. What happens after a fire? But it it, it does resolve itself. They don't stay around. They're, they they are looking for a home. Or they're just dying. I mean, they're yeah, in such they're bad dying. shape. Oh, they're in or, such bad yeah. shape. It was so sad to see yeah, them. For several weeks. Oh. Yeah. Um, oh. um, Susie asked a practical question. How long does peppermint oil last as a deterrent? Oh, uh, that's good. How often well, do you put it in yours? Maybe. That's, you know, that mm. it's really important to check your car. I mean, the number one deterrent is check your car often, <laughs> open up the hood. Uh, I was doing it week, I, I was seeing some droppings, so I was doing it weekly for a while and then, you know, every, and now every several weeks. But uh, just keep looking. If you see something, uh, spray, put some more spray on. <laughs> That's the rule. <laughs> um, somebody asked, does anyone know of a rat zapper meant for outdoor use? Um, they found indoor ones, but not an outdoor waterproof one. And I actually do know of um, some places that do have boxes that are, they have an electronic 
component, right? Not a bait box, the, but it's the a... The problem with putting any kind of trap outside is other animals can be trapped in there also. So we don't recommend any type of outdoor trapping, period. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, I can see that people are having these real, these real life questions about um, dealing with, like someone asked if we have identified rat nests up high in our oak trees, are we better off leaving them alone or do we have the arborist knock it down? I mean, mm. no clue I about, that, about one. that one. I didn't even know they lived in oak yeah, trees. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, Kathy, do you know where they live? The wood, the wood rats, they're natural. They're the, the natural. Well, Wood rats would be mostly on the ground. Yeah. Um, okay. And if it's, I mean, there are other rats that, um, like your non-natives, that could potentially be up in the trees, like roof rats and stuff, um, black rat. Yeah. Um, or it could be squirrels, too. Yeah. In your, um, so you might want to be careful and make sure you know exactly what the species is um, before you would knock it down, if you're going to knock it down. I think the main thing, what I would focus on is a lot of what we talked about is keeping them outside of the house. That's your primary, or in, outside, yeah, outside of the house and keep them outside. So your primary, you're always going to lose a battle of keeping them out of your yard. That's, that's, you're never going to be successful with keeping them out of your yard. That's, they're, they're there. So you have to, under, you have to have some sort of tolerance um, trimming up and thinning vegetation, things like that, and preventing having the food resources available for them. I can't stress that enough. Right. Um, but keeping them out of your house, sealing up and closing up is really important because that's where you really want to keep them away from. Um, but um, you, you have to have some sort of, there are, there are going to be rats there. there. There's no way of ever getting rid of them. And frankly, even the with boxes out there, there's still rats out there. There are still food resources for them. There's still coming around, um, which is why people are constantly putting it out. So really it's about that food resource and getting rid of that and the, um, what's attracting them and the vegetation that they can hide in. Um, Dave asked bird people how to deter a crow mobbing if I put in a raptor perch. Rat, crows beat beat hawks. I think I don't. We don't know. I don't. We don't know anything about that. <laughs> I, I never heard of that. Yeah. What, what's the question? The, crows crows versus versus. No, hawks. that the if 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 he put in a raptor perch, how would he keep the get keep the crows from mobbing the oh, raptors? I, I, well, you have to. Re depends on. I mean, if you know you have owls there, then a rap crows aren't going to affect the owls because the owls come out at night, right? So it would still be effective for owls, which are primarily going to eat gophers and probably rats. Um, and then um, I do know um, there's a woman in, um, in Agora Hills who put up two raptor perches, and she has tons of crows as well. And she recently um, had a, um, a red shoulder hawk on the perch. So They'll, they find their ways um, at some point, but yeah, that's, crows can be difficult. <laughs> yeah. I, I've seen crows and ravens chase hawks away. I've seen that. Oh, I wanted to mention that um, you both um, referenced the pilot, the raptor pilot um, project that they d did in Ventura, and we had Carl um, Novak oh. present oh, for us great. prior Thanks. to his passing. Yeah, um, a couple of years ago. And so we were really fortunate to have him. So I, I imagine there's probably some folks on this um, call that uh, were at that presentation. So that was really good to hear about it. And I do understand my understanding is that the Santa Barbara County mm -hmm. version um, as well does not have use any poisons. That's my understanding. That's yeah, that's where um, if you look at their study, that's where they got the idea. Um, yeah, I was happy to hear that when I spoke to some of those folks when I was at Earth Day a few years ago, that we're, we're not poisoning it at our water um, flood control level. We're not using poisons. Um, yeah, um, let me see here. 
So Scott asked what the link between mage and biocides is. Maybe Scott, you might've come in a, a little bit later, but Kathy did talk about that, um, that the biocides break down the immune system of the, of the wildlife and allows the mange to grow or the um, insect to grow, yeah? Yeah, it prevents them from being able to fight um, and stay healthy, even though yeah. they have an activity. Yeah, this, uh, the, the, the actual, this was conjectured for many years because it was obvious that bobcats who were poisoned were getting mange. But then this Dr. Laurel Ceres that I mentioned uh, at UCLA, working with the National Park Service, really got into the chemistry and biology of it and traced it down in, in a couple of very important papers, which, which she, I cannot understand. Yeah, but, she tested uh, <laughs> the blood, the blood, yeah. which no one was testing before. That was very but, clever of her. But she actually went into the genes and the chemistry and the enzymes and other stuff and said, here's, what's, yes. here's why the immune system is going to pot. Yeah, yep. mm -hmm. it made the immune system misfire and didn't know what to fight. Yeah. Um, could you, uh, uh, I think, Joel, it was you that mentioned this idea of getting a legislator to make a bill to um, reverse this preemption, statewide preemption thing. Is that something that's actively being worked on? And, you know, what does that look like? Did I understand that correctly? Yeah. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, we're, we're sort of uh, recovering from our AB 1788 <laughs> effort and <laughs> relaxing a little bit, but we are trying to drum up support from that. It's, it's, I don't think it's going to be that hard because at this League of California Cities, which is, I don't know, like several hundred cities with their representatives there is in Long Beach, uh, this resolution really sailed through like they have several committees it has to get through each one with like 50 representatives from 50 cities and these very conservative san joaquin valley agricultural areas said will we be able to do what we want and we yes. said yes unfortunately yes. that's true you could, a city you can, can use poison it as much as, as you much want as you like. <laughs> and then they said and this will get the state off our back and and decrease state control and we said yep man they were enthusiastic and cities <laughs> such as the santa monica mountains who yeah. don't want any poisons at all can yeah. ban them totally yep. so this is the key this is the key that we must strive for. Uh, we're waiting for the legislators to come back from break. Actually, they're on break now. Well, the whole COVID thing has to and the fade. COVID. So, but yeah. you know, we will. We are. This is definitely up on the plate. We already started it with the League of Cities, and uh, we've alerted our coalition about this idea. And now we'll we will have to be moving it forward and looking for a leader to uh, move this forward, uh, which yep. uh, is a is the solution to getting rid of all of them. Yeah, yeah. It, you know, we're doing A B C. You know, it took us four years. You know, and it, we started off with all the rodent poisons, and we got sliced up tr very <laughs> severely through the years, and uh, we're dealing with a multi-billion dollar company when we move to the right they have got two people to the left they had two permanent uh, lobbyists in sacramento we had none uh thankfully with this last try uh the um the league of uh, uh no, animal legal animal defense. legal defense fund came yeah. to our rescue they offered uh, us a lobbyist which was very expensive. Uh, we were told that we needed to have a lobbyist if we ever wanted to try to push this through, because there's, you know, we had all the statistics and 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 uh, and, and uh, references uh, to back us and and great support through our coalition. But when push came to shove, they had their their lobbyists there telling the lies to the to to their co to their team and to the to their assembly members uh, with their lies that you know that oh we have to have poisons to protect our children, pets, and wildlife. I mean, it, 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 their angle was just hysterical. But you know, this is this is their angle, and they'll always bring up the bubonic plague, and you, now you know they're full of it as soon as they start using the B word. And so it's fear and ignorance that rule the pesticide industry. And that's what we, that's why we're here to educate, uh, to break that uh, ignorance chain of, of, uh, of why people are using poisons. They use the fear stories constantly. They lie constantly to the public. 
and uh, it's got to end because there's too much damage that's happening now. And it's not just happening to our wildlife, pets and children. It's happening to us too. Okay. We, as I mentioned, we've got the pesticides in the air, in our water, in our food. Uh, I can go on. When you look at my website, because I've done a total uh, uh, review of pesticides, you will see uh, how we are also being poisoned. So please eat organic is my last words. And uh, uh, last last words would be poison <laughs> food. Yeah, poison. Yeah. Malibu.org, take a look. We've really researched a lot. As I said, you know, poison Malibu has a poison free policy. Uh, and uh, as we looked at all of the pesticides that are being affected on us, it, it's, and I'm, I'm a nurse uh, in the background, and I see how there is a rise in all of these types of uh, problems of cancers. We have endocrine disruptors neurotoxins and uh, cancer-causing agents that we're spraying on our lawns and uh, on recreation areas in our parks to kill weeds, okay? And so we're at that level. So that's why we have to look at totally pesticide-free policies, not just ending the rodenticides, the rodent, the rodent poisons. We must end all the pesticide uses that's happening in our communities that's poisoning all of us. And uh, this is absolutely essential that we, we stop these pesticides. They're going wild. They're in everything. We've got GMOs. We, we've got uh, autism. We've got cancers. We've got reproductive uh, problems. Uh, and, uh, you know, we don't – we're birthing handicapped children uh, with, uh, with these pesticides that are found in, in the mother's uh, blood. Yeah. So uh, we really yeah. have to look to a, a life free of these pesticides and, uh, and, and give a future to our wildlife, pets and children and, and our whole uh, uh, environment here that's being poisoned. Yeah. Our sheds, everything. Yeah. Thank you. It's really, I think, about a shift to a more ecological point of view in general as a society, which is a tall order, but um, we appreciate all of your work and for helping educate us here and for offering yourselves as resources for our own community uh, work in Santa Barbara and for uh, customizing your presentation to uh, speak about our areas and what's possible what's possible here and allowing, um, putting your great website up for, I have been on your website is, it's full of resources of all different types. So please check that out. And I thank all three of you again for your time and your uh, expertise and for being with us. And thank you all for all the participants for joining us. And I just wanted to wrap up to let you know that, um, we recorded the presentation and just like our first presentation, virtual presentation, it will be made available soon after a little bit of editing on our website, santabarbaraaudubon.org. And I hope that you will join us for our next program, which will be Wednesday, November 18th. Um, please note that the date is earlier in the month than usual due to thanks to the Thanksgiving holiday. Again, it's Wednesday, November 18th. The topic is garden focused, um, covering how to utilize native plants to create bird habitat at home with presenter Scott Pipkin with um, the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden and one of our brand new board members, as uh, Dolores mentioned. And we hope to see you there. So thank you all so much for um, attending and have a good night. Thank you, thank Teresa. You. Thank you, Teresa. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.